welcome students to epg patshala i am dr k s nagaraja of deccan college pune i am teaching the course historical linguistics today's model today's module is lexical change as uh, in the previous module we saw how words may lose their meaning which is uh, called semantic change on the other hand the forum may continue there that's why the emphasis more on the meaning part the way meaning gets changed or lost in due course of time whereas in this particular course that is the lexical course the forum changes meaning is secondary in the sense that meaning the forum when due to contact with other communities other societies may enter a recipient language if that particular forum is not there if the particular cultural item is not there or technology is not there like what we have today police engineer doctor table wrist watch etc etc all these forums have enter in a way whatever the native words these many of our languages had have lost them so here it is more emphasis on the lexical part rather than on the semantic part so the details will be looked at now by lexical change as said earlier it is about the forum forums the forums definitely will have meaning as their counterparts so the study of uh, lexical items is normally known as uh, etymology etymology means the true meaning of forum it is from greek so when a lexical item is taken from another society or it is borrowed if we use the word due to the technology or to the service or maybe a delicacy whatever may be it becomes part of the language now the lexical items can be obtained for various reasons in fact uh, many times it enters the realm of what may be called borrowing which is the next module which we are going to discuss actually etymology is the basis of historical linguistics for establishing the origin of a word is crucial to understanding the changes it has undergone and the factors that have influenced its development without a well worked out account of how a word like bead could shift in meaning from an abstract meaning prayer to a very concrete meaning small roundish glass or wood or ceramic object we could not really establish its etymology nor could we be sure about the effects of sound changes such as grimm's law in germanic without first positing etymologies for various lexical items that connect them with cognate words in other languages for example father as being from the same source as latin pater or ten from the same source as greek deco thus once a good many well established cases are examined working out the general principles that govern language chain can be undertaken so it all starts with etymology other types of changes like semantic change borrowing can significantly affect the lexical inventory of languages in this sense then etymology is also the study of the sources of words of the word formative resources that languages have 
and of how speakers use these resources. So, the study of etymology necessarily involves in the study of lexical change of how words rise and fall through time. For instance, borrowing almost invariably adds to the vocabulary even in cases of cocking. The only exception is loan shifts, which broaden the meaning of existing words but ordinarily do not introduce new ones. On the contrary, cultural, social and technological factors may lead to obsolescence of words at the same time may also necessitate the development or coinage of a great deal of new vocabulary. In the following sections, we will examine a number of processes by which the lexical store of a language can be enriched. New words in a language. Abundant examples involving the more productive sources of neologisms, that is new words in a language, are found especially in slang, advertising and political discourse. One, appearance of a new lexical item. When an object or institution is taken into a speech community from another culture as often as not, the name of the object or institution will be borrowed from the lending culture. However, if an item is discovered or invented within the given society, then its name often comes about by the simple creation of a new word. This is called coining. So in this uh, module, we, we may look at uh, how lexical items enter a language. There are many funny situations. It is possible that a word may just enter a language from nothing virtually uh, like blur or blurb or uh, the, it may, a word may come based on a personal name. There are many personal names uh, available on, based on the either the creator or even the, the person who gives the name or who identified it. For instance, these days we have uh, lots of cyclones. The cyclones are named after persons like Irma and others. Uh, it is just that the person who identified it, the, the person's name has been given, nothing else. So the lexical items enter a language due to various reasons. And uh, whatever is there originally, particularly uh, concerned with the culture, dress, and others, when they are out of use, those items, those words will get lost. So it's a very na natural happening in languages, old words being lost, new words entering in. In fact, uh, as semantic domains getting restricted, getting enlarged, getting shifted, here also we see a word may enter, may, be, may mean something else in due course of its journey, and new words get created, and uh, uh, we, we have lots of uh, uh, instances of, uh, for instance, uh, given by the literature, particularly in the, the words used in literature like blatant, bojum, chartal. In fact, a famous uh, scholar Lewis Carroll used that uh, as a blend, for instance. In fact, uh, uh, various acronyms used in the literature or in uh, science technology uh, all indicate to the creation of words. In fact, there are other ways of creating words also. For instance, uh, coining based on, uh, uh, on assumed connection. For instance, the gas, the word for gas, it is actually from, in a way, nothing. This word gas has a Greek uh, uh, connection, kaos, as a base and paraffin utilizes pieces from Latin.
So probably uh, we may look for better examples in slang terms because uh, in the normal language we it is hard to find such formations. Paraffin invented by Reichenbach in 1830 based on Latin parum, too little, barely, a finis having affinity. The creations are not really out of nothing for gas has Greek chaos as a base and paraffin utilizes pieces from Latin. So probably better examples may be found in slang terms, zilst, bonking, etc. and product names of course. A literary source of new words is literary coinage, new words created by or at least attributed to authors and famous people. Blatant as supposed to have been created by Edmund Spencer between 1590 and 1596. Bojum by Lewis Carroll Chartel by Lewis Carroll, a blend of chuckle and snort. Pandemonium, the abode of all the demons, the capital of hell, from John Milton's Paradise Lost, 1667, the pieces from which this was created are Greek. Yahoo, created by Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. The name created for an imaginary race of brutes with human form, coining from personal names, from names of individuals. We have examples such as Gallatin, borrowed from French Gallatin, named after the French physician Joseph Ignac Gallatin, who suggested that the instrument be used in execution in 1789. Sandwich said to be named after John Montagu, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, 1718-92, who spent 24 hours gambling with no other food than slices of cold meat between slices of toast. That's how the word sandwich has come. Walt, named after Alessandro Volta, Italian scientist and physician. Vandal, Vandalize from the Vandals, another Germanic tribe. The tradition of naming cyclones, storms, etc. Uh, on the name of the discoverer is well known. Palin, Nari, etc. We can mention many. Vandal, for instance, Vandalize from the Vandals, another Germanic tribe. From place names, also we get uh, new names, Canary from Canary Islands, Current ultimately from Corinth, alone from Old French Raisins, De Carons, modern French Raisin De Carinther. So we have uh, Many names come out, for instance, another interesting name is jeans from Genos for a twill cotton cloth associated with Geno. Sherry from Zerez, a place in Spain associated with this fortified Spanish wine. Spa is a place in Belgium celebrated for the curative properties of its mineral water. Turkey shortened from turkey cock, turkey hen, originally a guinea fowl imported through Turkey, later applied erroneously to the bird of American origin. From brand names like Coke, Cola, we get Coca-Cola, Frig, Frigidaire, Ninex, that is Kleenex, for instance, or Xerox, Hoover, etc. Acronyms. Acronyms are words derived from the initial letters or syllable 
of each of the successive parts of a compound term or word. CD is compact disc. DJ is disc jockey, etc. One can easily uh, add to that list. Compounding. Compound words are those coined using more than one free morpheme or two distinct words. Some new compounds, all nighter, brain dead, coach potato, that is lazy person, down market, downtown, knee jerk, etc. In the case of older compounds, late changes often make the original components of the compound no longer recognizable. For example, elbow, this is actually from Proto-Germanic Alino for, forearm a, and Bugan bend or bow. Compare Old English ain forearm cubit. Gossip again is from Old England Old English gobas gobai gobai uh, that means related one who has contracted spiritual affinity with another by agreeing to act as sponsor at a baptism which came to mean family acquaintance friend and a woman's female friends invited to be present at a birth and to someone usually a woman of uh, light and trifling character to the conversation of such a person idle talk in some cases only one part of the compound is identified today for example the word cobweb from middle english cop that is spider plus web nickname plus an plus ek that is additional plus name so from that we get nickname there is an plus ek plus name we get nickname werewolf it is from old english where man cognate with latin vir plus wolf we get uh, werewolf in addition to compounding new words are derived more or less productively through the employment of various derivational affixes in word formation processes for example auto in autopilot auto suggestion mega in mega sound mega mart mega show micro in micro oven microprocessor micro surgery etc quite a few can be listed here the next type is amalgamation amalgamations or forms formerly were composed of more than one free standing word which occur together in some phrase which as a result of the change get bound together in a single word for instance english nevertheless and already are no single words but come from the amalgamation of separate words of never the less and all and ready english has many words of this sort in whose background lies the amalgamation of earlier separate words into a single lexical item amalgamation is often considered a kind of analogy so uh, already we have mentioned the examples almost all and most all one becomes alone all plus together become all together all plus ways becomes always hopeless ever becomes however etc actually those cases which are called grammaticalization or instances of amalgamation where formerly independent words are amalgamated with the result that one becomes a grammatical affix. For example, mente in mind from the absolute, from the oblative of Latin mens mind was grammaticalized in the Romance languages as an adverbial critic in Spanish or suffix in French. The next type is clipping. Clipping means 
compression, shortening or ellipsis. Often new words or new forms of old words come from clipping, that is from shortening longer words. There are several examples from English which follow show this uh, process. For example, bike is from bicycle, omnibus from omnibus, uh, then we have uh, tele from television, gym from gymnasium, limo from limousine, etc. indicate clipping the short forms are generally preferred compared to the longer ones. Then the next type is expressive creations, onomatopoeia is another source of new words, creations with only sounds in nature as a model, thought to be the source of words such as buzz, gag and so on. Interjections also can be uh, observed as a new source like oh, ah, wow, oh, but obviously they are highly limited. Then next important one is obsolescence and loss of vocabulary. Obsolescence, that is the loss, takes place when the society ceases to use the item in question and as a result the word falls out of everyday usage. Could be because of non-use or because of unfavorable connotations like Jew, Negro, etc because of that type. A lot of vocabulary has been lost periodically between Vedic Sanskrit to Prakrit to New Indo-Aryan uh, stage. Uh, here a few examples are listed from English. Dose bell, a common name in the 16th century but no longer used now. Fribble means a trifler one who professes rapture for a woman yet dreads her consent. Rogitate to ask frequently etc. So another important uh, area where wherein we lose lot of vocabulary is called taboo. The unfavorable interpretations, connotations which come to the words. Taboo tends to lead to frequent vocabulary renewal. This can be gauged by the large number of lexical replacements for tabooed words, especially for the ones considered most objectionable. There are cases of lexical replacement where a meaning remains, but the phonetic realization of it is changed in some way, usually by substituting some other lexical item which had other denotations of its own before the change. Thus lexical replacements involve more than meaning shifts although change in the meaning may also be involved. Changes involving taboo and obscenity are prime examples of this sort. For instance, in English as long-eared animal related to a horse has essentially been replaced in America by donkey because it is considered too close for comfort to obscene as there arise extra. In some instances like chest which is which is so close to the other name for breast, limb for leg, white meat for chicken breast, dark meat from chicken legs and thighs, drumstick from chicken leg show that the right side forums are replaced by the left side forums due to taboo of the right side forums. Words of this type make it necessary to make a distinction between taboo induced replacement and taboo induced deformation. The effects of taboo induced replacement and deformation can be quite far reaching. Many Austro-Asiatic Austro Polynesian Micronesian societies, for instance, have the tradition that upon the death of a person, his or her name is subjected to taboo. 
also animal names are subject to numerous taboos and the normal name is avoided in certain circumstances like hunting cooking eating and so on then a nickname is invented often by using a kinship term like uncle grandfather followed by a pun or an expressive adverb expressing the animal in the course of time the kinship term is abbreviated thus many animal names begin with the same letter the normal name is forgotten and the nickname becomes the standard as such it is then in turn avoided and the process is repeated so this kind of uh, this type of taboo has been reported by a, a scholar gerald de flot moreover since names tend to be compounds of ordinary words of the type noble warrior slim waster or dances with wolves their component parts likewise may be subject to taboo even deviations there even derivational and inflectional affixes may be affected a few examples could be quoted besides uh, what i mentioned earlier the word tongue due to taboo induced deformation has taken its toll to such an extent that the phonetic nature of the reconstructed word cannot be determined with greater precision so taboo may lead to a considerable turnover in the lexicon requiring the coining of many new words extensive and constant vocabulary renewal is perhaps even more common in certain special forms of language the one i have already mentioned is taboo the others like uh, uh, slangs jargons very by very nature they cannot use normal words because basically they are used for communicating among certain limited groups whether due to uh, their uh, secret nature like burglary thefts or dacoits or like extremists they need to always keep their vocabulary not only small but also uh, not known to others so as soon as they come to know that somebody else knows it then we have another type of uh, uh, language or a code where new words are created and they are restricted in their use the one is called argot argots are the speech forms used by certain communities specifically to hide the messages although difficult to differentiate with absolute precision these forms of language use can be distinguished roughly as follows argots are secret languages intended for in group communication that is to remain unintelligible to outsiders argars commonly are employed by criminals but they may also be used by other groups especially the suppressed or disadvantaged an instance of argot from varanasi has been reported by a scholar by name mehrotra uh, which has been published so it is a very interesting case here we have uh, we have a situation where within a radius of 1 km around the vishwanath temple in varanasi one investigator found for found for numerals 1 to 5 several distinct sets of secret number names used by such people as diamond dealers silk merchants fruit and vegetable merchants and pandas so this table provides that information is a very interesting case how the the members of those communities use words to conceal to hide their real intentions the second one is jargon the major purpose of jargon is to serve in group communication 
and social cohesion. Much of its special vocabulary consists of technical terms, but there are also expressions, often humorous, that serve as marker of solidarity, like uh, the jargon of lawyers' jargon, uh, the jargon in the jails, for instance. Uh, that kind of jargons uh, are available in the societies. The third type is slang. Slang is to ordinary language what up-to-date, youthful and somewhat outrageous fashion is to ordinary dress wear. Because of their nature, argars and slang are especially in need of constant lexical renewal. In the case of argars, the purpose is to maintain secrecy. If outsiders hear or got words often enough, they can catch on to their meanings and the words are in danger of losing their secret nature. As for slang, the motivation for constant lexical renewal is similar to the motivation for the constant changes in dress fashion. There is nothing more stale than outdated slang or yesterday's fashion. Since the need for lexical renewal is strongest in slang and orgards, most of the examples given below come from these two forms of speech. It may be noted that slang, orgards and jargons are complexly interrelated with each other as well as with ordinary language. In many cases, the precise source for a given word or the mechanism by which it acquired its meaning is shrouded in mystery. Moreover, words are borrowed from one sphere of language used to the other. This is especially true as far as slang is concerned. Time and again we find that in order to maintain its novelty, slang adopts words from argots and jargon. Finally. Although speakers tend to resist the intrusion of slang into ordinary language use, they are far from successful in doing so and slang or jargon words frequently become part of ordinary vocabulary. Such instances in a sense represent a type of borrowing from one variety of the language into another. Cases like fake which entered English language through or got in the meaning of any illegal or criminal action but especially that of stealing or robbing. But the exact origin of the word remains a mystery. No, it has been accepted in ordinary English. Other words of similar ancestry but now in fairly common use are kid, ordinarily young goat, Kester, originally from German or Yiddish kiss box, Vogel from Dutch, Vogelinge, little I, etc. So we may say that for lexical change, semantic change is one of the major vehicles for creating the vocabulary that distinguishes argots and slang from ordinary language use or for maintaining the distance between these forms of speech and ordinary language. Consider, for instance, recent argot words for police in English, such as the heat, the fuzz, and smokies. The expression, the heat, no doubt, reflects the fact that the police put the heat on criminals. Like that, the, the, very pres the very use of normal words with a special connotation is also part of slang. So that after all, the, the purpose is to hide the actual intent. In addition to semantic change, argots, jargon and slang commonly draw on borrowing as a major source for vocabulary renewal. The donors for borrowing, borrowing commonly are languages of groups that are marginalized in society and thus often forced into illegal or criminal activities. The multicultural, multi-ethnic 
and multilingual nature of the sources of English or God can be gauged from the selected examples given below. Uh, the a table is given, it can be read by the students. Besides metaphorical extensions and borrowings, are gods in slang resort to a large variety of other means to coin new terms like using abbreviatory forms as in below. Uh, slang def is definitive, excellent, rod, radical, triff, terrific, etc. While Argards usually are secret languages of the underworld, they can arise under any other circumstances that call for secret communication such as prisoner of war, war camps or slavery, etc., cults and all that. To summarize, lexical change is a change which affects the vocabulary of a language. The vocabularies, though always uh, will come with the meaning part, but the forum is very important here. The forums cannot come in isolation. They have to come with the meaning to, be, to become part of linguistic entity. When the vocabulary changes, it could be addition or it could be loss, it could be modification or shift. So because of this, the lexicon can get affected in, a, in any given language. To promote lexical change, obviously contact with other communities is an important uh, aspect. Proliferation of literature is an important uh, aspect. Of course, uh, uh, technology also adds to it. Further, aspects like taboo is a very important factor, mechanism for lexical change. The need for new words to counter the old words. Taboos could be of various types, connected with uh, kinship, with culinary aspects, with uh, sociological aspects, anywhere taboo plays a role. In addition to this, we have we can notice that the speech the speech forums like argars, jargons, and slang commonly draw on borrowing as a major source for vocabulary renewal. The donors for borrowing commonly are languages of groups that are marginalized in society and thus often forced to illegal or criminal activities. The multicultural, multi-ethnic and multilingual nature of the sources of English or God can be uh, studied uh, fruitfully. So in fact, this kind of situation can be found in any language is worth studying. The students need to look at their own languages to, to identify such words. In fact, look at their, the literature if available and to trace whether the, the earlier words are continuing or they have been lost or they have have the same meaning or different meaning as well. So uh, the references given and also which are available in the internet may be used for furthering this particular course. Thank you.